1928, George Washington Hill, the president of the American Tobacco Company, saw an opportunity to expand his market. Up till then, it was socially taboo for women to smoke. If that was to change, the American Tobacco Company could potentially double its sales. How do you change social norms for profit? How do you manipulate public opinion to benefit the interests of the few? Back in the 20s, your options were limited, but some men were willing to help you for a price. These men were called propagandists. Edward Bernays wasn't only one of these propagandists, he was a pioneer in the art of propaganda. His obituary would call him the father of public relations. This is why to delve into the world of propaganda, his 1928 book Propaganda is unavoidable. And I think that, especially on this channel, when aimed at looking at art, sometimes movies, sometimes shows, or just images with specific ideas and messages, it's important to understand, or at the very least discuss, propaganda. Washington Hill approached Bernays to convince women to smoke, to convince the broader public that a woman smoking isn't something to condemn. We're 10 years after the end of World War I, business is booming, and in the United States, women just got the right to vote. In this context, Bernays launched a campaign to get women to smoke. Torches of Freedom, a term borrowed from psychoanalyst Abraham Arden Brill, would be how Bernays used the need for women to empower themselves, to free themselves, and become equals to men. By hiring attractive women to light their torches of freedom at the Easter Sunday Parade in New York City, Bernays created a scandal. Behind us are the days when smoking was reserved to men. Women are now free to smoke, and this freedom is symbolized best when smoking. To advertise cigarettes, Bernays didn't only advertise the fact that the American Tobacco Company sold cigarettes, he linked the product to an idea, and a pretty strong one at that. The idea of freedom. And to sell these cigarettes, he aimed his advertisement at a specific demographic which, especially at the beginning of the 20th century, craved freedom and had the means to get it. He aimed it at women. This is one of the many examples of campaigns Bernays would set forth, and these campaigns would pave the path to the development and refinement of the art of propaganda. Once, advertisement was often reduced to facts. My product costs this much. My product offers this feature. My product has these characteristics. You are putting your product in front of an audience so that when they make a choice of products, they can consider yours. Bernays, however, often advertised indirectly. When hired by the American Tobacco Company, he didn't advertise its products or its brand. He advertised cigarettes in general, knowing that a significant increase in the sales of cigarettes will unquestionably increase the sales of the American Tobacco Company. I hope you understand how Bernays pushed propaganda from a tool of persuasion to a whole system aimed at shaping the culture you live within. The implications and consequences of such a system are unfathomable, from how our world is shaped, to who shapes it, and to what ends. We're about to delve into a system which shapes our world, a system which is openly anti-democratic, anti-freedom, a system which unashamedly works against the common good. But something important to know is that in his book Propaganda, the one we're about to delve into, Bernays defends propaganda. It often reads as propaganda for his services as a propagandist. He's selling his abilities to capitalists and politicians. And this is exactly what makes this book fascinating. It's selling propaganda and public relations for what it truly is. Bernays is not hiding anything or using any euphemisms. We're learning about propaganda from one of its fathers. And it's honestly terrifying. That propaganda easily seduces even those whom it most horrifies is a paradox that Bernays grasped completely. And it is one that we must try at last to understand if we want to change the world that Edward Bernays, among others, made for us. Before getting into it, I want to let you know that on the day I publish this video, I'll be streaming. It's something I've been wanting to do for a while now, so if you're interested, Come hang out, ask questions, and we can chat about propaganda, AI art, or whatever comes up. See you there. 
In the first chapter of the book, Organizing Chaos, Bernays explains why propaganda is used and why it's necessary. The first sentence of the book is the most sinister one. The conscious and intelligent manipulation of the organized habits and opinions of the masses is an important element in democratic society. Those who manipulate this unseen mechanism of society constitute an invisible government which is the true ruling power of our country. We are governed, our minds molded, our tastes formed, our ideas suggested, largely by men we have never heard of. Here, Bernays isn't wearing a tinfoil hat. He's not denouncing an invisible government. He's describing it and justifying it. He's telling his audience that in a democracy, we need an invisible government. And he's also implying that through his services as a propagandist, you get closer to become an invisible ruler. As I was editing this, I felt like the idea of the invisible government might be misinterpreted. Bernays is not talking about the Illuminati or groups of people meeting in dark rooms and deciding how to rule the world. He's talking about a system of incentives that gives power to a small group and that this power is akin or comparable in its effects to an invisible government. He's not a conspiracy theorist. That's what I meant by him not wearing a tinfoil hat. Organizing chaos is how he justifies this invisible government. He explains that in order to live smoothly in our huge complex system, we need people above us to sift through all the information. As a society, we can only process a very limited amount of information, whether it be politically, economically, socially, or ethically. We need people to tell us how to think, or at least narrow the possibilities as to how we can think and make our decisions. Bernays takes, for example, the American electoral system that effectively offers two choices to its population, thereby bringing simplicity and efficiency. Our choices of the products we buy are theoretically determined by the quality and cost of the product. However, we can't test the quality of every product, its pros and its cons, that would make buying groceries, for example, a nightmare. What we do to avoid this confusion, as Bernays says, is we rely on people in power, who we know nothing about, to narrow our choices for us through, notably, propaganda. And this is applicable to policies, commodities, and ideas. Bernays agrees that propaganda can be used with bad intentions, but he says that this doesn't take away the fact that propaganda is necessary to orderly life, and increasingly so. Back when organization was based in village communities, commodities, ideas, and opinions were limited by the small amount of people in the community. All of it could be debated inside that community and people made decisions from there. With modern media, and Bernays is writing this in 1928, there's an unprecedented level of diversity and complexity in our ideas, commodities, and opinions, mostly because we broke out of the village community model. We can now exchange with people from all across the country, all across the world. Propaganda, Bernays says, serves to organize this chaos. This is how Bernays explains the why of propaganda. I don't know about you, but I'm not entirely convinced by Bernays' justification of propaganda. I love his honesty about the invisible government, but then he ties it to democracy and explains how both are intertwined. The very concept of democracy is antithetical to the idea of an invisible government. Both cannot coexist. If you have an invisible government, you don't have a democracy. Bernays is very perniciously using the idea of democracy to sell propaganda. The main arguments against democracy is usually the ideas that society is too complex for it to be ruled by all, that we need an authority to make decisions, an authority to smoothly run our world without too much debates and arguments. Bernays is giving those arguments, and he's saying that we need unelected rulers to smoothen social organization. I personally would argue that elected rulers are also undemocratic, but that perhaps is for another day. Bernays is explicitly anti-democratic, and he's selling his abilities to give more power over the masses to the powerful. The new propaganda explores what propaganda is in the 20th century. 
Bernays opens the chapter by reinforcing his anti-democratic ideas by saying that because of universal suffrage and universal schooling, even the bourgeoisie stood in fear of the common people, for the masses promised to become king. Today, however, a reaction has set in. The minority has discovered a powerful help in influencing the majorities. This help is obviously propaganda. The minority can wield the power of the educated and voting masses for its own benefit, effectively empowering itself. And this, Bernays repeats, is inevitable. Propaganda is the executive arm of the invisible government. Bernays goes on to defining propaganda, bemoaning the fact that it has a negative connotation. To him, propaganda is inevitable and can be used for good or for bad. Anyone who has ideas and convictions they want to spread has to use propaganda. By organizing or formulating a way of convincing others to adopt your ideas, you're making propaganda. This book is propaganda. This video about this book is propaganda. Here is Bernays' definition of propaganda. Modern propaganda is a consistent, enduring effort to create or shape events to influence the relations of the public to an enterprise, idea, or group. New propaganda doesn't only target individuals, but looks at the anatomy of society by seeing the individual not only as a cell in the social organism, but as a cell organized into the social unit. Touch a nerve at a sensitive spot, and you get an automatic response from certain specific members of the organism. Propaganda is a tool, Bernays concludes, often used by people unknowingly. A group of housewives, as he explains, can think of a good policy, but they'll need to use propaganda to organize and communicate their intents in order to turn their ideas into action. But clearly, Bernays adds, it is the intelligent minorities which need to make use of propaganda continuously and systematically. In the active proselytizing minorities in whom selfish interests and public interests coincide, lie the progress and development of America. And it's upon reading that that you realize why Bernays is enabling so much evil, yet believes he's doing good. The fact that he doesn't see a problem in the idea that his self-interested powerful clients can manipulate the entire country because their self-interest is the interest of all is extremely harmful. The idea that propaganda can be used for good or for bad is too simplistic when analyzing the ethics of propaganda. Monarchy can be used for good or for bad. We can think of plenty of ways in which a monarch could be a good monarch, but this doesn't stop the concept of a monarch to be reviled. The concentration of power is too dangerous. We can't give a handful of people too much power. Because of too much power. And this is the problem with propaganda and Bernays' use of its definition. Propaganda is harmful insofar as it's used to concentrate power. If only the powerful can use and afford propaganda, they can use propaganda to consolidate their power. And this is exactly what is happening. The selfish interests of the intelligent minority don't coincide with the public interest. The concentration of power in the hands of the intelligent minority isn't in the public interest. The propaganda Bernays is defending isn't merely influencing people's relationships to enterprises, ideas, or groups. I think anyone agrees that this influence is part of the democratic process. The propaganda Bernays is defending is one using concentrated power to influence people's relationships to enterprises, ideas, or groups. Using propaganda as a tool to shape a world favorable to the interests of the minority is what Bernays is advocating for, and it's what has been shaping our world for decades. The New Propagandist answers the who of new propaganda. Bernays opens by explaining just how powerful the invisible government is. He argues that this power doesn't only serve in politics or on a larger scale, but he also argues that, in some departments of our daily life, in which we imagine ourselves free agents, we are ruled by dictators exercising great power. But don't worry, that's all for the greater good and for democracy. Then Bernays answers the who of propaganda by talking about concentration of power. 
To advertise on a scale which will reach 50 million persons is expensive. To reach and persuade group leaders who dictate the public's thoughts and actions is likewise expensive. For this reason, there is an increasing tendency to concentrate the functions of propaganda in the hands of the propaganda specialist. Bernays predicts that the propagandists or public relation councils will have their own departments and firms because it will be necessary for those in power to maintain public acceptance. And he was right. Just like a legal council, a public relations council is essential to any powerful enterprise. He gives many examples of how a propaganda specialist would be necessary. If the corset makers, for instance, wished to bring the product into fashion again, he would unquestionably advise that the plan was impossible since women have definitely emancipated themselves from the old style corset. Yet his fashion advisors might report that women might be persuaded to adopt a certain type of girdle which eliminated the unhealthy features of the corset. From there, the propagandists analyze their public. They study groups, leaders, influences. They look at demographics, study their targeted clients, their habits, etc. And the propagandist may be hired for a single job, but can also be hired in permanence, because you might need, for example, as a corporation, to deal with rumors. The permanent public relations counselor feeds himself with information to help you develop the optimal relationship to the public in order to secure your profits. They may also, through this constant analysis of the public and markets, develop new ways for you to make money. Bernays follows this by saying, if we accept public relations as a profession, we must also expect it to have ideals and ethics. However, he doesn't really develop on the ethics of the profession. He says it's comparable to the code of ethics of doctors and lawyers. He gives the example that a propagandist should refuse a client whom he believes to be dishonest, a product which he believes to be fraudulent, or a cause which he believes to be antisocial. Small pause on that. Jacobo Arbenz, Guatemala's president in the 1950s, adopted a land reform which redistributed uncultivated land to landless peasants. He also made working conditions and labor laws a lot better for workers. The United Fruit Company, an American corporation working in Guatemala who owned a lot of land and relied on the poverty of their workers to exploit them, didn't like Arbenz and his reforms. So they employed a propagandist to convince the American government and the American public that Arbenz was a dangerous communist. In 1954, the CIA conducted Operation PB Success, organizing a coup d'etat, installing the military dictator Carlos Castillo, and destabilizing the once democratic country for decades. The propagandist behind this coup d'etat was none other than Edward Bernays. Bernays goes on when talking about ethics. He does not accept a client whose interests conflict with those of another client. He does not accept a client whose case he believes to be hopeless or whose product he believes to be unmarketable. He should be candid in his dealings. It must be repeated that his business is not to fool or hoodwink the public. If he were to get such a reputation, his usefulness in his profession would be at an end. However candid Bernays is about talking about invisible governments or dictators exercising great power, which he believes, by the way, is desirable for democracy to work, Bernays is a lot less candid about the ethics of his profession. It seems to boil down to don't do bad because it'll make us look bad and our whole thing is to make ourselves and our clients look good. Bernays answers the why, the what, the who of propaganda in the first three chapters. In the fourth, he answers the how. I won't go into it much, and I encourage you to read the book for yourself, but he mainly talks in this chapter about the psychology of the masses, which his double uncle, Sigmund Freud, knew much about. In this chapter, Bernays identifies an important aspect of the how of propaganda, and this important aspect is a paradigm shift. Under the old salesmanship, the manufacturer said to the prospective purchaser, please buy a piano. The new salesmanship has reversed the process and caused the prospective purchaser to say to the manufacturer, please sell me a piano. Businesses and the public are intertwined more than ever. Public opinion matters more than ever. 
Bernays explains that if business interest doesn't align with public perception, or if public perception isn't manipulated to accept business interest, then the public might vote in restrictive laws against businesses. Another reason why the public and businesses are intertwined is because of mass production. Historically, the problem of production was to make products. How do we make products to answer a demand? However, the question today is different. A single factory potentially capable of supplying a whole continent with its particular product cannot afford to wait until the public asks for its product. It must maintain constant touch through advertising and propaganda with the vast public in order to assure itself the continuous demand which alone will make its costly plant profitable. To make customers is the new problem. Creating new desires, manufacturing new needs, encouraging consumption. This is what a propagandist does. Bernays then talks about the tendency in our growing economy for businesses to continually grow and expand to a point where public relations will be necessary. Public opinion is no longer inclined to be unfavorable to the large business merger. It resents the censorship of business by the Federal Trade Commission. It has broken down the antitrust laws where it thinks they hinder economic development. It backs great trusts and mergers which it excoriated a decade ago. This result has been, to a great extent, obtained by deliberate use of propaganda in its broadest sense. It was obtained not only by modifying the opinion of the public, as the governments modified and marshaled the opinion of their publics during the war, but often by modifying the business concern itself. Public opinion and business behavior is molded in order to make the public compliant to business interests. But it would be rash and unreasonable to take it for granted that because public opinion has come over to the side of big business, it will always remain there. Bernays goes on explaining how a great deal of effort will be needed to make sure that the public continues to favor big businesses, and he warns against the tendency for people to want to nationalize businesses. Nationalizing businesses, by the way, is when a business is owned by the government so its profits, instead of going into the pockets of individuals, are distributed through social services. Speaking of governments, the next chapter is... The great political problem in our modern democracy is how to induce our leaders to lead. The dogma that the voice of the people is the voice of God tends to make elected persons the willless servants of their constituents. Fortunately, the sincere and gifted politician is able, by the instrument of propaganda, to mold and form the will of the people. Bernays' problem with democracy is that it's democratic. He is profoundly anti-democratic. Though he might defend the right to vote and the right to free speech, this is not what democracy is reduced to. A monarchy could be elective and could guarantee the right to free speech. Bernays seems to advocate for an elected oligarchy which guarantees the right to free speech, not for democracy. He makes that very clear. To him, politicians shouldn't represent or enact the will of the people because, honestly, you can't really represent such an abstract concept. Bernays thinks, however, that politicians should create the will of the people, forge it, manipulate it. He argues that politicians should adopt the business model of propaganda, that propaganda is especially good for them because politicians aren't always the best sellers. Ours must be a leadership democracy administered by the intelligent minority who know how to regiment and guide the masses. Is this government by propaganda? Call it, if you prefer, government by education. This, of course, is only a short summary of the book, and again, I recommend reading it. I haven't gone over the later chapters, women's activities and propaganda, propaganda for education, propaganda in social service, art and science, and the mechanics of propaganda, in which he ends the book with these last two sentences. Propaganda will never die out. Intelligent men must realize that propaganda is the modern instrument by which they can fight for productive ends and help to bring out order out of chaos. Edward Bernays is the perfect embodiment of his craft, of propaganda. He's a man who manipulates us, or tries to manipulate us, all throughout the book. In the name of democracy, he'll advocate for the rule of a minority. 
In the name of public good, he'll advocate for the good of the wealthy. In the name of his benevolent will to lead the masses towards progress, he'll advocate for the promotion of the profession and the services he sells. As Bernays says, propaganda is not bad in and of itself. Like I said, this video is propaganda and I don't think I'm doing any harm through it. However, without wanting to minimize the influence and responsibilities that I have, my propaganda doesn't have nearly as much reach and as much power as propaganda pushed by the wealthy few. And I think there lies the importance of reading this book, of understanding propaganda and understanding its uses. If people were equal as we are thought to be, then propaganda could be a great tool to communicate ideas on a larger scale, to debate socially on different social and moral questions. Good and honest propaganda is possible and probably necessary in democratic societies. And even if people are equal, there can still be bad propaganda, unethically produced propaganda or propaganda with unethical aims. However, in a system where the concentration of wealth and power are in the hands of so few, propaganda is extremely dangerous. Propaganda is expensive, and in a world where people's wealth is correlative to their power, propaganda is a despotic tool, a tool wielded to subvert democracy. This brings up another question, how democratic can a capitalist society truly be? I don't fear propaganda on an individual level. There will always be ethical and unethical propaganda. What I do fear is the systemic incentives through which propaganda is used. When those in power are the only ones with the means to effectively use propaganda, they'll use it to conserve their power. Propaganda in a politically or economically unequal society will be used by the powerful. And that's who Bernays sells his abilities to people who have the means to manipulate the public in order to protect their privileges. And this is why when you see art, images, movies, shows, ads, messages, events, news, opinions, you need to ask yourself, who's paying for them? Why are they spending money on them? And what is their end goal? If powerful people are using their power to convince you of something, is it also to your benefit or is it solely to theirs? Thank you so much for watching. Thank you for liking and subscribing if you have already. And I'd like to thank, as always, Roman Brando, Mike Wex, and every other patron for supporting the channel. If you also want to support the channel, check out patreon.com forward slash the canvas. Thank you.